Here we are on the Sabbath day, being able to come before God and to worship Him. You know, I received a word from God this week. It was truly revealing. What a revelation. It was eye-opening. It was a cleansing of the mind. I got straightened out all right. I got a word from God. How did I know it was from God? Well, the reason I knew it was from God was because it was the truth. Oh, there's no mistake about it. It was the truth. I couldn't deny it. There was no way of getting around it. I couldn't run. I couldn't hide. I was caught. I was guilty. I got a word from God. Who told me? My wife. My wife told me the truth. It was God's word. So I entitled this sermon, Am I Right with God? I guess I found out that I wasn't as, as right with God as I should have been, and I was told in those very words. I did agree. I couldn't deny it. I had to agree. I bring this up because it's time. It's time to examine ourselves. Why? As I deliver this sermon, we are seven weeks from Passover. And by the time some of you will view this tape, depending on how soon it gets shipped out, we could be very close to a month from Passover. It's time to look at ourselves. It's time that we take a test. Oh, I don't like tests. I had dreaded tests in school. Multiple choice wasn't too bad. At least you had a chance of getting some of the answers right. But essays? Essays? You were either right on or you were right off. There was no way of faking an essay. You either knew the answer, you knew how to, dis to explain how the government works, you knew the three branches of the government, you knew the legislation, you knew the executive branch, you knew the judicial branch, and you could be very verbose on all of it, and you'd get a flying color of an A, and no problem. But if you had no inkling of what the teacher was asking on an essay question, it was automatic. There was no way of bluffing it. Multiple choice, you had a fair chance. True and false, 50-50. I hated tests. What good were tests? Why did I have to have a test? Didn't the teacher know that I knew the material? Wasn't I attending school? Wasn't I sitting there in a seat? Well, she thought, or he thought, maybe I was just warming that seat. The teacher was going to find out if I knew anything. So it was test time. And so as we approach Passover, as we approach this opportunity to once again rehearse God's plan of salvation, Paul very plainly told us that we were to examine ourselves. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He tells us what we need to do. Beginning in verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. For though He, Jesus Christ, was crucified in weakness, yes, He was a human being. He's the one who's made it possible for you and I to have a relationship with God. He was crucified as a human being. His flesh was torn off of His body. He was destroyed physically. That's what sin does to us. It destroys us. And Jesus Christ had to be destroyed because He became a sin sacrifice. Yet, though He was destroyed, He lives because God has the power of the resurrection. Jesus Christ said, I am the life and the resurrection. He lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in Him, but we shall live with Him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves as to whether you and I are in the faith. That's what we're to do. We are to take a test. Examination time. And we are just a few short weeks from partaking of those symbols. That is the bread and the wine. 
and having our covenant renewed with Jesus Christ. He says, prove ourselves. Now, I know the automobile companies don't put a car out until they test it. At least we hope so. Sometimes we think they haven't because we're the ones that end up with the lemon. It barely gets out the showroom, down the block, and something goes wrong with it. No, they have testing grounds. You've maybe never been out west to Salt Lake City and seen the Bonneville test, testing flats as they go racing across the salt. Beautiful country that they have used as a testing ground. You've seen the ads where they take the vehicles and they run them over rocks. That if you and I were to run our vehicle over, over the rocks, it'd be destroyed. But somehow, as they show us this beautiful all-terrain vehicle is able to maneuver through water that would drown out my engine, it keeps on going. They test their equipment. Sometimes I don't believe it's as truthful as it should be. But you and I are to test ourselves. We're to take an examination. We're going to come before God and He wants us to know how we are doing. He wants to know if we're truthful with ourselves. He knows what we're like. He's already tested us. He, he knows what's in us. He knows how we're thinking. He knows our mind inside and out. He wants to know, can we be truthful with him? He has the perfect answers about us. He knows when we lied last. He knows when we cheated last. He knows when we didn't pay our tithes last. He knows if we've been faithful to him in all these areas. He knows how well we've been doing as far as observing his law, his commandments, his statutes, his judgments. He knows. Now he wants to see whether we're able to confess our sins to him, to fess up, as they say, and know that we know ourselves. For that's what Paul says. Examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith. Prove ourselves. Do we not know ourselves? Oh, it's easy to try to think we know until someone points out that I'm not right with God. And I agree, there are times when I am not right with God. I know the winter doldrum sets in. We get into a habit, a very lazy habit. The sun goes down sooner. It rises later. The days are shorter. The less daylight, the less work I do. That's the way I am. I'm happy for winter time because I don't have to work so many hours. Now I'm one that works from sun up to sun down. I love being outdoors. But when there isn't any sun outside, and when it's cold, and when the wind is howling, and there's snow on the ground, the sooner I can get into the house, the better off I am. At least how I think. But you see, that isn't always what's supposed to be done. Do I not know myself? Yes, sadly in some cases I know myself very well because I'm a creature of habit. I get up in the morning and there's things to do before I go to work. There's prayer time, of course. But then the animals need my attention. The dog is howling and barking. He wants me to feed him, to break the ice in the water. So there are advantages to winter time and there's disadvantages. And so I'm cold in the winter and I love the wood stove and I've worked hard to provide all this wood and I intend to see that it doesn't go to waste. <laughs> that it doesn't lie around collecting mold and dust and whatever. It goes in the wood stove so that I can be warm when the wind is howling outside. But when the warmth comes and settles over my body and I have done the chores outside and I have split enough wood for the night and I have brought it onto the porch, then it's my time to kick back and catch up on all that sleep that I lost in the summertime when I worked from sunup to sundown, which seems like the land of the midnight sun, 
from morning to night. I'm being a little facetious, but do we know ourselves? Do we know that we're creatures of habit? And what I do one day, I do the next. And these weeks go right on by. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and here's the Sabbath. Then it'll be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I can almost plan my week because I know what I did last week. I'm intended to do it this week. I don't intend to make any changes because I love the way I did it last week. It was beautiful. The weeks just roll by. And I'm catching up on my sleep. I'm having a good time this winter. Until someone says, no, you're not. No, you're not. Am I right with God? That is how we must look at ourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you and in me? Unless, indeed, we are disqualified or, as it can be better translated, we don't stand the test, we don't pass the test. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So Paul is very plain in saying that we must look at ourselves. We need to examine ourselves in the light of God's Word. There are times we do get lazy with God. There are times when we don't have a dynamic relationship with God. Maybe our prayers don't reach much beyond the ceiling because we have got ourselves into a laid-back condition. The doldrums have set in. The wind is not blowing because that's what the doldrums are across the Pacific. Anyone who's done any sailing or has studied sailing knows that when the doldrums hit, you might as well just pack up the sail and lay back because you're going nowhere. <coughs> Well, the doldrums sets in, and sometimes we don't make any progress. We don't overcome. We don't change until someone shakes us by the back of the neck and says, wake up, let's get busy. So it's time. It's time to examine ourselves. It's time to focus in on the soon coming renewal of God's plan of salvation. It's amazing how much we might have forgotten from last spring to this spring. And for those who might be new, it's time to learn more about God's plan of salvation and understand its purpose. So we need to examine ourselves. We need to look at what God is doing. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, Paul says, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's time that the sap begins to rise in the tree as springtime comes. It's time that we get renewed. And that's amazing how God does that. How he allows the sap, as the leaves fall off the tree, to go back down into the roots to give the roots the energy that they will need to be pushing that sap back up the tree once again to have a renewal, a rebirth. You know, we're crazy as human beings. We start our day in the middle of the night. We start our new year in the middle of winter. It's backwards. God starts the day at sunset. God starts the new year in the spring. God's logical. We're not. And so God is looking at us and he wants us to say, wake up, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Do it God's way. Become right with God. He says, open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have defrauded no one. He says, I don't say this to condemn you, for I've said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. He says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. And Paul had to endure a lot of trials and problems as he preached the gospel, as he traveled across Asia, 
Minor and on over into Greece, into Macedonia, as it says here, where he had no rest. He, had, he was troubled on every side. There was conflicts, there was confusion, there was fears, there was frustrations, there was everything to discourage him and try to get his mind off of doing God's work. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, verse 6, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So when we are not in tune with God, so God's going to send someone. He's going to send someone to wake us up and help us to be ready for His time of renewal, the rebirth, the rededication of the plan of salvation. He's talking about the time when he had to write 1 Corinthians, send them a letter saying, wake up, repent, change. He says, verse 8, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Though I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance means to change. Turn around and go the other direction. So as we approach Passover, we need to see where we've gone astray. All sheep go astray eventually, sometime, somewhere, someplace. We have all gone astray. And now it's time to focus in on what God is doing and examine ourselves to see, well, maybe we only stepped a little ways from God. But we know as human nature enters in, if we step one step away from God, it's easy to take another step and another step. And before we know it, we're many miles away from God. For godly sorrow, verse 10, produces repentance to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For to observe this very thing that you're sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligent it produced in you. Diligence. Got to work. It's not time to be lazy. It's not time to settle back into the comfort zone. It's not time to let old habits continue on. It's time to be working. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. Oh yes, it cleanses the mind. What indignation. What fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The first, when the first letter hit them, the Corinthian church was in for a shock because Paul left nothing out. He hit every base. He hit home run after home run after home run. He was right on. The Corinthian church took that letter and they repented. They saw their sins, they saw their shortcomings, and he says, it did what it was supposed to do. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. I did it out of love and deep concern that you might understand what God, how God was looking at the situation and that you would therefore change. And they did. And God's expecting you and me to change. He's expecting us to measure up. To, 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 to measure up to the fullness and statute of Jesus Christ. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Why is the church... Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That's what we need. We all must come to the unity, oneness of faith. To, for the work of the ministry is to provide a means that we can come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. We are to measure up. Measure up to what God's standards are. So we take this time to look at our lives, to see where we've been this past year, 
to see how well we've done, how much we've overcome, what changes we've made, how closer we are to God, or how free we might have slipped. We measure ourselves not by comparing ourselves among ourselves, because if I were to do that, I would think very highly of myself. I measure up very well compared to everybody else. I mean, isn't that the ego? Isn't that human nature? Isn't that the way we like to look at it? But God says, don't compare ourselves among ourselves, but to measure ourselves according to the statute of the fullness of Christ. And what an example. What a personage to measure ourselves with. Jesus Christ, our high priest, our elder brother, our savior, soon coming king. He's the rock. That's who we measure our lives with that standard. What a standard. Of course, we all fall short. We all fall short of that standard. Yet, that's what Paul is saying. The church is here. The ministry is here. We're all together. We're here to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are to build upon that foundation and be like Jesus Christ. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, who endures trials, who endures testing. If we don't test, have our lives tested, if we're not going through a period of testing, then we think everything is okay. We think nothing's out of place, nothing's wrong. But as soon as we are faced with a temptation, a test, a trial, a difficulty, we find out what we're made of. We find out how close we are to God. We find out where we have slipped, where we have fallen. So we know that as we approach Passover, Satan's going to be out there throwing all kinds of monkey wrenches in the gears and try to discourage us, to frustrate us, to bring us through a lot of trials and difficulties. And God allows it. Even God does test us. He doesn't tempt us, but he does test us. He puts us through certain trials and difficulties. For when that man is proved, tested, Abraham had to be tested. God says, first, leave your homeland. So he left his homeland. He finds himself in a strange country where nobody likes him. They run him all over the countryside. Even his nephew takes the best, leaves Abraham with the worst. Then Abraham has to go up and sacrifice his son. A test, a trial, a problem. But when he's tested, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, we're not tempted by God, as it says in verse 13, because God doesn't tempt us with evil. He doesn't place evil in front of us. He doesn't tempt us with evil. We have our own minds, our own lusts, our own desires, our own thinking, our own way of doing things, our own habits that maybe we haven't quite overcome as we should, draws us away from God. And of course, when we're enticed, then it leads to sin, and we are in deep trouble with God because sin cuts us off from God. Unless sin is repented of, we will end up in the lake of fire. But we are to endure the test. We are to endure the trial. We are to prove to God that we are worthy of His intervention. That uh, he, he sees growth in us. That He sees that we're struggling with this life. That He will then give to us a crown of life. Not because of our righteousness, not because of what we've done, but our willingness to fall on the rock and allow the rock to cover our sins, to come to Him broken-hearted, repentive, so that truly no flesh can glory in His sight. It's not our righteousness. It's what God has done in us because we've allowed Him to do it. 
And in order for God to do it in us, we have to humble ourselves. We have to examine ourselves. We have to admit to God, this is the way I am. I don't like the way I am. I need your help to change. I need your help to overcome. You work in my life because you're the potter and I am but the clay. Dropping down to verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflowing of wickedness. And sometimes that's the condition God finds us in. That we have succumbed to the ways of this world, that we have allowed Satan to enter into an extent where he has tempted us and we have been drawn away. And just as in the springtime, the mountain streams will be overflowing with water because of all the snow melt, we'll be overflowing with wickedness if we're not careful. He's telling them, James is telling them to lay aside, examine ourselves, look in the mirror, look at God's Word, and lay it aside. All the filthiness, all the sin, all the wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our souls. Be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. See, it's very possible to hear, but not do. To think that we're doing, when actually all we're doing is hearing. And then maybe we're not really hearing, it's just going in one ear and out the other. Until someone says, this is the Word of God. And you have a sudden revelation about wow, you truly are. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. We look in the mirror, we comb our hair, we brush our teeth, we shave, we put on perfume or lotion or whatever. And as I am, I go out and the wind catches my hair and I forget about it. And I don't look any better than I did before. See, I observe myself in the mirror, I go away and immediately forget what kind of man I am. And that's what happens if you're a hearer and not a doer. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and that's what I'm asking us today, are we as faithful to God as we should be? Are we continuing in God's word? Or have we slipped? Have we fallen short? Or have we been forgetful, as it says here? Maybe we have been. Is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So this is what we must do as we approach that time of year, as we examine ourselves and come up to observe the beginning of God's plan of salvation. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, what do we do? We uh, pass on the other side of the street. We uh, ignore it. We forget about it. No, he says, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted or tested or tried. We have to be careful, but if God has given us the ability to see and discern and someone needs our help, we do that. And that's what's beautiful about a marriage in God's church because the wife can help the husband, the husband can help the wife, and they see each other's faults and they can deal with it in a godly manner, a spirit of gentleness, bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And Satan's out here trying to deceive you and me, and certainly he would try to bolster our ego a little bit so that we could come up to Passover and say, well, I've examined myself and I didn't find anything wrong. I'm perfect with God. In fact, I don't even have to test myself. I know where I stand. I'm perfect. That's how Satan would like to deceive us. 
He thinks of himself more than what he truly is. When the Apostle Paul says, we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. And John says, if anyone says he doesn't have any sin, then he's calling God a liar and the truth is not in him. So we need to get down and do the hard work of examining ourselves. Asking God to show us where we have gone astray. Asking God to straighten out our lives. Asking God to say, what's wrong with me? Why am I not right with you? Why am I in this doldrums? Why am I depressed? Why am I discouraged? Why am I frustrated? Why am I pulling my hair out? Why, God, help me to see myself as you see me? But let each one examine his own work. Oh, it's easy, as Christ was telling the Pharisees, you know. You, you, see, you see that little tiny speck in everybody else's eyes, but you don't behold the beam that's in your own. See, let each one examine his own work. How have I built? How have you built? You have to answer to God. I have to answer to God. What have I done this past year? Examine my own work, and I will have rejoicing in myself alone and not in another. We don't get into the kingdom of God on the curt, curt, coattails of someone else. We just don't. I know it was said a long time ago that if the wife wasn't totally submissive and loyal and faithful to the husband, no matter what he was doing, she had no chance of being in the kingdom. She had to f obey her husband no matter what. Well, he's out here. He doesn't care about the Sabbath. He doesn't care about this and that. He's slipping. He's backsliding. He's whatever. The wife best not follow the husband. The wife had best maintain her relationship with God because we stand on our own two feet and we must come before the judgment seat and answer to God on our own merits, not on someone else's. For each one shall bear his own load. We do have a staros to bear. We are to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Now we don't do it like some religion, religious people do. They don't, they, sometimes they get down on their knees and they crawl mile after mile and beat themselves over the back, and when they get to their final destination, they pin themselves up on some type of stake and hang there, trying to make an amends with God, thinking that God is well pleased with their physical sacrifice. When God indeed wants us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, the mind, the heart, the thoughts, purge all of that, that's what needs to be on our shoulder to, be, to bear it, and take it before God and confess our sins before Him. For we must bear our own load. We must answer to God for what we think, what we say, and what we do. God is judging us, testing us, examining us, and He wants to purge, as David said, everything. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and reveal to me my secret sins and have them purged away too so that I can be in your kingdom, that I can dwell in your house forever, not to pat myself on the back, not to go around praising myself, but so that I then will be able to go out and teach someone else that I might instruct others how to live. Because if I, through your help and your intervention, can change me, then I know you can help someone else and change them. Let's turn over to Amos. Amos chapter 3. As we examine ourselves... We must come before God. And as God took ancient Israel to task, 
And he sent prophets to them to try to show them what was wrong with, the, with them, why God was angry with them, why God was going to take them into captivity, why they were going to suffer a lot of hardship, trials, and difficulties. God also tells us, and these words are here for us too. It says here in Amos chapter 3 verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God knows ancient Israel. He knows Israel today. He knows His people. But He's also creating, as Paul said, a nation, a peculiar people, called out ones, spiritual Israel, a nation that will be born in one day, that this whole creation is groaning and moaning for, is waiting for the sonship, the redemption, the birth, the renewal, the change, as Jesus Christ comes back and sets up the kingdom and establishes His family, of which you and I have the opportunity to be a part of. God knows this. The church, the called out ones. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. If he will do that to a physical nation, he will do that to the spiritual nation as well. Because the bride will have made herself clean, purged, white, ready to be in the family of God. And God will correct us. He will chastise us. He will see us through to the finish. Chapter 4, verse 6. What happens to the nation of Israel? Could happen to you and me to do today. Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Some people wonder why they may have had setbacks this year. Maybe they haven't been as faithful with God as they should have been. Maybe. Maybe that's not the reason at all. Maybe they were... They were as close to God as he possibly could have been, and yet God was, like, like Job. Job was righteous, yet God wanted to show him some other things, and so he put him on the pile of ashes. Allowed Satan to do it, to, for Job to come to God in a much deeper, more powerful, more purposeful, more exciting relationship with God. So he says, I'm going to give you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. What's it say? There's going to be a famine of the word. God's going to test us. Will we be able to exist in a relationship with God when there isn't anybody teaching God's word? Will we have had enough in our brains to be able to stand a time of famine? So we examine ourselves. What have I done this past year? Have I prepared for a famine? God says I'm sending you a famine. Not of food and water and all that, but of hearing of the Word of God. Are we preparing ourselves for a time of famine? How well would we do? He says, when I've done that to you, a lack of bread, a lack of water, a lack of everything, what do we do? What did ancient Israel do? They cursed God. That's what they're going to do at the end time. They're going to curse God. God, you're not fair. Instead of causing people to repent, He says, you've not returned to Me. Will you and I return to God when He begins to deal with us in a very severe way because we're not as close to Him as we should be? We haven't examined ourselves like we ought to. We've taken Passover lightly. Maybe He will shake us up a little bit. Verse 7, withholding rain, withholding everything else, and still people don't repent. Verse 12, therefore thus I will I do to you, O Israel, and because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Same thing to the church. Prepare to meet God. Jesus Christ is coming back. People are going to wonder why they're still physical. They're going to meet God. They're going to meet God. God's going to say, I'm sorry, depart from me, I never knew you. You're workers of iniquity. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So I'm asking and pleading with us today that we meet God now on His terms, with His conditions, and measure up to the fullness and the statute of Jesus Christ. He set the pace. He walked this earth. He did it. 
perfectly. And we are to follow his footsteps. Dropping down to chapter 5, verse 14. Seek good and not evil. Has that been our guideline this past year? Has that been in our minds that we're always seeking good and not evil? Because if we do, then we're going to live. We'll be in the kingdom of God. So the eternal God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. Are we fair with our dealings with other human beings? Is our handshake as good as it was in the 1800s or the 1700s? Or do we need to get the lawyers out and write up a contract that's about 50 pages long and make sure we dot every I and cross every T and not leave a single thing out because just somewhere, somehow, someone might find a loophole. Justice! Are we fair? It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Oh, we've been taking it easy. Just goofing off, being lazy, non-productive. And yet we're running out of time. Not only is the spring holy days coming, but Jesus Christ is soon to come to this earth. How much more events are to occur? How worse is this world going to be? We're on the verge of nuclear warfare. It's just a matter of days, a month, years. It's not going to be very long. The Iranians mean business. They're not bluffing. They're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. That's their intent. Who's going to stop them? Well, the king of the south is going to push it to the king of the north, and the king of the north is going to deal with it. And in the process of the king of the north dealing with the king of the south, that's only going to make the hordes of the east angry. And unless Jesus Christ returns, there wouldn't be any flesh left alive on the face of the earth. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Oh yes, I just need that widescreen DV. I just need to just lay back, take it easy this winter. I don't need to work. I don't need to study. I don't need to do anything. Don't need to fast. Don't need to pray. I'll wait till spring. No. God says we're at ease in Zion. Oh, we trust in Mount Samaria. We trust in the government. The government will take care of us. Take care of us. That's how this society thinks. Social programs. Unbelievable what I heard that one politician would like to do to the oil companies. Take their profits. What's that? That's no longer capitalism. That's socialism. Take from the rich and give to the poor. Why should I work? The government will take care of me. I don't want profits. If I got profits, somebody will take it away from me. And yet that's the solution to our problems. Trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to, to Canel and see, and from there go to Hamath and the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Think about it. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seat of violence to come near. I'm happy. I'm content. I have everything I need. I'm satisfied. Why rock the boat? Why get excited? It's a long ways off. Jesus Christ is not returning this year. Is he? God has my breath in his hands. I'm here one moment and gone the next. I'm a breath away from death. Who's to say that I'm to live till the time Jesus Christ returns? Woe to those who are at ease. Chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the eternal God are on the sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it from the face of the earth. 
Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Eternal. Five virgins are wise and five are not. God sees. He knows. He's given the church plenty of time to make choices. He sees those who continue to make the right choice every year. We can't rest on our laurels. Just because I obeyed God in 1975, God seeing if I've obeyed Him in 76 and 77, He's looking at it. Now we're down here to 2007. He's saying, will I find the church growing? Will I find the church coming out of sin? Will I find the church preparing for the return of Jesus Christ? And if not, I will destroy it. Jesus Christ said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Cast you out, is what he said. It applies to the physical nation. It applies to the spiritual nation. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. What's he say? If I'm going to take you through these trials, these problems, he says I will not leave you nor forsake you. If we're faithful to God, no matter how we're sifted, no matter what trials we go through, no matter how mild the testing might be, how severe, not the smallest grain will fall to the ground. He knows those things. says, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say that calamity shall not overtake us nor confront us. So we need to take these words that Amos had to go to the northern ten tribes and tell them that they were sinning, that they was going into captivity, and it would just be a few short years and they would be gone. Did they wake up? Did they listen? No. And they never returned. Will you and I wake up as well? Psalms chapter 69. Psalms chapter 69. As we look at what David was writing in a time of trial and difficulty, when he was tested, he says, Save me, O God, verse 1 of Psalms chapter 69, for the waters have come up to my neck. Now, waters can't come up much higher. They're up to the, up to the neck very few inches away from the mouth and the nose. When waters covers the head, it's over. He says, I sink in deep mar. And there's no standing, there's no footing. I am keep going down. And when my head is covered, it's over. I've come into deep waters. How long can I tread water? When the, where the floods overflow me. He says, save me, O oh God, because you're the only one who can do it. As we examine ourselves, do we find ourselves needing God more? Have we depended on God more this past year? Or have we depended on our own selves this past year? When the trials have come, has God been there? I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail when I wait for my God. Sometimes we get impatient with God. Have we gotten impatient with God this past year? Well, he's in a severe trial. We said God didn't answer. So we take matters into our own hands. <laughs> Ancient Israel always did that. Kings did that. God, remember Saul? Remember King Saul? He was always taking matters into his own hands. He was in a severe trial. He couldn't wait for God. Job was in a severe trial. He says, I'll wait for my Redeemer. I will wait for my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. I know there's God out there. I know God is working in my life. I will trust in God. I will fear none evil, for thou art with me. So we ask ourselves, as we went through periods of testing and trial, as we examine our hearts, our motives, our thoughts, our processes, everything that's you and me today, are we truly inspired to do it God's way? David says, I know, my throat is dry. I'm, I'm just about to my wit's ends. But I'm still waiting on God. My eyes fail, but I'm still waiting. I've gone blind. I've gone deaf. I've lost everything, but I'm still waiting on God. Because I know 
that God is my salvation. Verse 13. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O eternal, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mar, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me out of the deep waters. What do you think Jeremiah felt? What do you think Jeremiah was going through when they threw him in the dungeon, cesspool, and he began to sink? He says, God's my Savior. He's promised me that I will be able to endure all this. Verse 29, But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your hearts shall live. They may be broken. We may have lost loved ones. We may be going through severe trials and problems. We, our health is, it seems like it's escaping us. We're getting weaker and sicker. We, we're, we seem like we're wearing out faster than we should be. Yet we know that one day we'll live if we remain faithful to God. For though the eternal hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him and the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell in therein and possess it. There's coming the wonderful world tomorrow. And you and I as the church have a relationship with God that no other human being will have. The church, the church in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. The church, the people, the, the called out ones that marry Jesus Christ. There is no other relationship that will be quite like that. Yet God in His decisions have called you and me. He's the one who calls. He's the one who's given us this chance. He's the one who's given to us everything that we need to make it. Yet we have our part to play. We have a part of examining ourselves to search the soul and to see just where we stand with God. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse 20. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? I have it coming. When I sin, I have it coming. But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you and I are called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. Who committed no sin, nor was guile found in His mouth. For... When he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Just like David said, it is God who can save me. There's no one else. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes we are healed. And we know we can turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Don't have time. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. And we understand what Jesus Christ went through. We understand the sacrifice. We understand all that He had to endure in order to be our high priest. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. For He who made Him, that is God made Jesus Christ to be our sacrifice. Is, what's it say in John chapter 3, verse 16? God gave His only begotten Son. For He who made Him, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Him. What did I ask? What was the simple question? Are you and I right with God? Are we? As we approach Passover, Examine ourselves. Are we truly right with God?